And we finally get to the Bangtan universe <laughs> after so many interruptions. We're finally here. So I will be going through the entire story, the entire universe from beginning to end. But I will be starting with Begins Youth since that is the most recent and it's going to help explain some of the storylines that they introduced in the music videos, the notes, and the highlights as well. Now, just want to make a disclaimer first. I'm not claiming to be right. This is my interpretation. You're definitely welcome to disagree. Maybe there are some things that you want to input as well. Things that I've missed that will be more than welcome. That is the whole point of actually doing this. Second disclaimer, there will be a lot of spoilers. A lot. And so if you don't want to know what happened in Begins Youth, don't watch this because I'm going to be talking about the stories, what happened. I'll be showing in on YouTube. I'm going to be doing some screenshots and on Patreon, it'll be more detailed. So if you don't want to know anything about that and you just want a traditional plane review, this is not for you. There will be a lot of spoiler alert. Okay, on to the video. Kim Wan, the oldest in the group, he is rich, ultra rich, and he is a son of a politician. At the beginning of the story, he just came back to the town after living in the U.S. for a while. He doesn't seem to have any sibling and isn't very close to his father, and his mother is yet to be explained. He is very reserved, very much to himself, and very much in his head. He isn't necessarily snobbish, just very much occupied. You know he has this heavy burden on him, and you can physically see it in the way that his broad shoulders droop down, his back slouches, and his steps are so tentative. And we just have to give it to the actor, So Ji Hoon. He managed to physically show the heavy, invisible burden that's crushing his soul. From the very first scene when we see him, it felt like he was born with the shoulders of a king and the heart of a crucified mother. He was, till the very end, the odd one in the group. Not just because he comes from a shiny mansion, but because he is the most guarded one. He certainly wanted to fit in, but he was scared of what he could bring to the group. The baggage of a world paved with gold. Even when he started actually loving his friends, you can feel the uncertainty, the struggle to give in, and that is an important part because in the end, he will be the one fighting for everyone when everyone has given up on themselves. Min Sein, the second oldest in the group. Min Sein is the stoic member. He was the resident troublemaker and was perpetually in detention, and he liked it that way. His mother passed away in a house fire and is believed to be the one to have actually set the house on fire. In the public's eye, he was his mother's murderer. He has no siblings and his father is a military guy and would go home only on weekends, if at all. Sein is cold and alienated from the world. And you can see it in the emptiness of his eyes. It always feels like there's an opaque wall in front of him, perpetually playing an impending hell about to consume him. And worse, it didn't feel like he minded at all. He felt okay with it, welcomed it even, maybe even longed for it. There is no saving him, and that's the biggest hurdle. How do you save someone who doesn't want to be saved? The actor who played Sein, No Jong Yoon, had a tall order in front of him. Because Sein doesn't move a lot, he doesn't say much either. That meant he had to largely rely on his eyes and try to magnify the small movements that Sein would do. And No Jong Yoon nailed it to the core. Jung Ho Su, the resident dancer. His mother left him in a theme park after telling him to wait and giving him a bar of sneakers. He grew up in an orphanage, but is lucky enough to have a good guardian. He has this positive energy in him, a glass half full kind of attitude towards life. At least, that's how it seems. He does suffer from narcolepsy triggered by any emotion connected to his mother. While all the characters, feel unwanted from the very start or at some point in their life, the most painful kind of abandon was Hosus, at least in my opinion. 
because it wasn't death or separation or hardship that separated him from his mother. He was just left behind. It seemed he was simply unwanted. He justified what his mother has done, insisting she must have had her reason for abandoning him. That seems to be enough to fuel him forward. It gives him some energy to keep his body moving and prevent his mind from racing. The worst part is that no one saw the delusion he created, the maddening reveries of his happy insanity. It was perhaps a little too late when one of his friends, specifically Dogun, found out just how far gone he really was. And by then, the burden was on Dogun. Because the question became, will you want to shake someone out of his rose-colored filters to face reality when he is happy and fine in his madness? An Ji Ho, the actor that played Ho Su, made it really difficult for me to separate him and J-Hope because my god, he is so on point from the way that he talked to the way that he moved to the way that he would stand. In so many scenes, it really felt like I was watching J-Hope. But to his credit, I can't imagine any other actor will be able to pull off the portrayal of such sincere attempt at happiness. Kim Dogun, the smartest one, but the clumsiest one. He is smart and works several part-time jobs in order to pay the debt of his family. One of his part-time jobs allows him to stay in a container where they actually often gather as a group. He is very close to Kim Ju An, the second youngest in the group. He seems the repository of truths no one should know and the keeper of wisdom of lives never lived. It is perhaps why, of the seven, his story never seems fully his own. He works for his family. He thinks for his friends. He tries to correct the mistakes of other people and pays the sins of his elders. His story is pushed forward by the things that he do for other people. It's probably why he gravitated towards one, the eldest, even if they got off the wrong start. One was the one person that could measure up to him, a steady force that he could lean on to in silence. And so while he seems to be a passive character, the actor rather than an active participant, it is because his struggle is as much about his own emotions as it is about morality, responsibility, and quite frankly, intellect. He can't live for himself. It is a curse he is living. So Yung Chu, the actor, portrayed this with so much nuance and it's interesting to watch him talk with so much certainty, but not a lot of confidence. I was surprised just how much he was able to communicate Dogun's helplessness on being the one who knows and being the one who should do something about it, even though he doesn't want to. Park Haru, the third youngest in the group. He is well off, not as rich as Kim Wan, the eldest, but still well off. He transferred from another school and became very close to Ho Su, the dancer in the group, because he also likes dancing. Early in the series, they reveal that he is suffering from some form of mental illness triggered by a trauma during childhood, an experience he was forced to forget instead of being encouraged to confront. Of the seven, Haru is the one that is most distant from everyone else, even from the audience, but you don't feel that. Kim Yun Woo was able to portray this character with so much warmth and so much lightness that it actually makes you forget you don't know much about Haru. And he does this mostly by how he reacts to other actors when they are the ones talking. There's a certain focus on his eyes that he's there and listening to you. Even the way that his body responds to other actors makes you feel that he's fully present and wants to be there. But the truth is that even his friends don't know much about him. He is the most detached, but in that terrifyingly warm way, like he was meant to be alone and everyone is supposed to be okay with it. Each of them has different demons in them. Kim Juan is trapped by his own guilt and hopes. John Jeha, the youngest, is actually lost in the dreams of his own mother. Dogon is getting crushed by the weight of others. Hosu is living a lie. Sein 
isn't even interested in living and one is fighting to find a place to belong. But Haru's demon is fully formed and is living in him. In fact, we get to know more about the demon than we do about him. That sometimes it's confusing to determine who is this that's talking. Is it the obedient son and the perfect friend? Or the man who whispers the truths of the world no one wants to hear? And in the end, we're left wondering, who is the real Haru? Kim Juwan, the second youngest, he lives with his alcoholic father. He has a sister. Their parents are divorced. His sister has been asking him to live with them, but he couldn't turn his back on his father. His father tried to kill himself once and Juwan didn't want his father's blood on his hand. And that is just too much for anyone, let alone a high schooler stuck in the slums. Anger has become his only way to cope. It's his only path to invincibility, his only way towards survival. Being angry excuses him for doing anything that he does, to not care, to hurt others, to hurt himself. So it has become his default. He's angry when he's worried. He's angry when he's sad. He's angry when he's happy. It is the only thing he is good at. He isn't good with anything else. He isn't good with happiness. He isn't good with love. He certainly isn't good with forgiveness towards others or towards himself. Jung Wo Jin played the role carefully because the guy is easy to hate and the haircut they gave him didn't help much. Juwon is impulsive and rough. But Jung Wo Jin, the actor, found the perfect angle, the perfect expression that he shows whenever Juwon's anger means something else. Vulnerability, confusion, or even love. And all you gotta do as a viewer is pay attention. Yes, a lot of it is on the writing. The narrative, after all, is primarily reliant on the script. But the warmth of the character is all on the actor. John Jeha, the youngest in the group. His mother married a rich man for money. He sticks to Sein, the second eldest in the group, like glue, and treats Haru, the third youngest, like his younger brother. He is the most dangerous to others and to himself because he wears his masks like a second skin. He can turn off his humanity as fast as he can summon his demon. He is cunning and can play people like a grand master of life. He can look angelic and sweet while planning your eternal damnation. And it is nothing short of a tragedy considering he is the group's only salvation. However, unconsciously, he is often the reason the group even smiles. The fuel to everyone's fire of life. John Jinso, the actor, emanates innocence for the most part, but during moments when he taps into his angst, you can literally see him switch right in front of you, transforming into this scary but scarred monster. So powerful, he can literally end the world in a single breath. This series feels more like a prequel, a premise to an epic story of how our choices fulfill our destiny. If you have ever sat down to brainstorm the development of a story, one of the first things you do is develop the characters. You develop their history, how they grew up, their personalities, hobbies, dreams. They should be so real to a point where you know what's inside their purses or how their rooms look like when they were growing up. That's how this feels like, an exploration of each of the characters and the formation of their friendship more than a group adventure or a group struggle. Just to be clear, they each had their own stories, but they didn't have a common goal in the beginning. And that leads me to the next point. They didn't have a clear objective as a group or for the group in the beginning. A group or an ensemble in a movie usually has a shared objective or everyone is included in a certain objective. I'll use popular ensemble movies as an example. In Avengers, all of them were trying to save the world. In Lord of the Rings, they needed to return the ring in Mordor. In Little Miss Sunshine, they needed to help the kid to get to her pageant. Here, their individual stories were introduced, individual struggles, and how some members intersect with one another. 
but the group adventure or the group objective started at the end. That's why I think it's a prequel. By the end, I had more questions than answers. That is not necessarily something new and it's not bad either, but it's way more acceptable in a mainstream show to provide more answers at the end. Opening more questions happen when there is going to be a sequel. Avengers movies do this a lot. Unparalleled depth of characters. These characters are some of the most beautifully complex ones I have ever come across with. They are so painfully damaged but immaculately kind. There's just so many layers to their story, how they became who they were and how they are trying their darnest best to form some semblance of life given the limited cards they were dealt with. The characters are so powerfully intriguing that it was actually enough to drive the story. They didn't need a common objective yet. Unlike the cliché of mainstream stories though, these characters aren't fully formed yet when we meet them. They are growing up before our eyes. Each character is so lovable, so magnetic, and so damaged that they draw you in. And it isn't because you want to help them out of their situation. There's just something about their journey, how undeniably strong they are despite the circumstances and how beautiful their bond is that make you not want to interfere. You just want to witness the unfolding of an epic story. I watched the series from two perspectives. First perspective, and the most important, more important for me, is the perspective of a critic and lover of TV shows and movies and narratives and literature. And then the second perspective is me being a fan of BTS. But there is something in the story that made it sometimes impossible for me to separate the two. And that is how they felt so wrong for each other. Like they had nothing in common, no reason to be friends, and yet they perfectly fit together. And one of the characters, one, the eldest, actually said that. He's, he said they, they're they everything that is wrong for each other, but they're still meant to be together. If I were the producer and these characters were presented to me to for a, a, a story of friendship and a story of love, and, I would reject it flat out because it looks and feels so wrong on paper. But then you see them together. They defy what we know of relationships. They defy what we know of love. And they defy what we know is possible out of human compassion and forgiveness. And that is the main magic of the entire series. Is us seeing things about relationships that we never thought can happen and in some respects should happen. Their existence in each other's life is an irony. Jung Ho Su wants his mother back. Kim Dogun has a mother, but he feels like not having one will set him free. <laughs> uh, Juan has parents. And both are alive, but they are not there for him. Jeha has two parents, but they are not his. This, if you examine all of the characters, there is always that irony. And it goes in any combination. There will always be that irony. That what the other person needs, what one person needs, the other person has. They all have blood on their hands. Much of their struggles really start with other people's lives being on their hand. Dogun, his father's life, is on his hand. Juan, his father's life and existence, is on his hand. Jeha, his mother's existence and life, is on his hand. Haru has someone we don't know about. Um, the, the only source of life, like if you look at each of the characters, everything that surrounds them sucks the life out of, out of them. The only person that breathes life into them is each other. Hope failed them, and hope was their biggest failure. I felt like had they gave in to the reality of the situation, had they gave, had, 
at any point in the story had they given up i felt like at the very least they would have had peace even if they still not find happiness but because they clinged so much onto hope in the end it did hope didn't reciprocate didn't show up <laughs> and i think that is the single most depressing i say depressing thing in the series is that usually hope is the last thing people cling on to before victory but in this story hope was the last thing they clinged on to just before they failed and that was so sad and and just heartbreaking basically um yeah that was kill them uh not literally okay so um th that's the rundown on, of the characters if you are on patreon you saw some of the scenes uh if you're on youtube you didn't <laughs> you saw some screenshots <laughs> okay um so i'll go through each of the episode next time at least you got an idea on their characters who they are uh, their conflicts and storylines i'll go through each of the episodes in the succeeding once in the succeeding videos and i hope that you will also share your point of view the things that you like about the series the things about the characters uh would love to hear it i always love geeking out i always love diving into narratives and stories and this is a damn good one not perfect but pretty good all right thank you so much for watching i appreciate you all don't forget to like subscribe and hit that notification button and then um, subscribe to me on patreon on x or twitter and also on instagram thank you so much i appreciate y'all